I believe we're on. Hi there. I've done this a thousand times, so I won't be the least bit nervous or uncomfortable at all <laughs> talking to you about my passion, radio. Also my passion, rock and roll music and live bands. Also, I won't hit my glasses on the microphone at all during this presentation. And lastly, there's another, no, that's it. That's all it is. Oh, in Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon is also another passion, which ties into this whole thing. And oh. Finally, how does hot tubbing come into this whole thing? I will try to somehow tie these together in the next one hour or maybe 10 minutes, depending how fast I talk and go through the slides. I'm Scott Hammond. I am not responsible for this brilliant title. That goes to my lovely wife who's drinking beer in the back. Because I was coming up with all these titles for this thing and she just kept going, no, that's horrible. So she came up with that, which actually makes perfect sense. So what I'm gonna do is Take you, well, first I should tell you what Radio Hot Tub is. Radio Hot Tub is a radio station, sort of. Broadcasts on the internet, it streams online 24-7. Uh, what's on there is local bands out of Portland. Every, every song you hear on there is from a local Portland band. Uh, most of them do not have record deals or maybe don't even have much of a following. But some of them are amazing, some of them are great, and most of them are at least really dang good. And they all play original music and write their own songs and perform in clubs in Portland and they're trying to get people to come to their shows. So the birth of Radio Hot Tub, well, we're gonna go back to the birth, but the current status of Radio Hot Tub is supporting local music, trying to get people out to clubs to see local bands and to give a forum for these local bands on this radio station, Radio Hot Tub. That's not it, that's another thing. So we'll get to Radio Hot Tub by going way back in time. My first sad confession is I'm not from Portland, I know. I am technically, I guess, not really Californicating Portland, though, because I came here via Canada. So I tell people I came here from Canada, which makes me kind of cool and international. But um, yeah, I grew up in Los Angeles, and um, I'm sure if you are here from Portland, every, anybody in this room, of all these, we got like 150 people here. The camera can't capture it all. Um, how many people here born and raised Portland? One dude. <laughs> You remember, like, radio, did you ever have a radio passion at all? Like, is there anything when you were growing up, like, oh, I like to listen to the radio, or just maybe never, right? There was the, there was the X. Shows. Yeah, there yeah. Was the X. The, the X? X? The, the X was like the uh, metal, metal. Okay. Oh, so I never even heard of that one. I know KUFO used to be a big deal. Yeah. Not so much, right? Before, before. Oh, this is all before that. And then there was the B. There was okay. The and KBOO would be, like, weird stuff there once in Yeah, really and they're still around. KBOO's doing their thing. So for me, going back in time to what influenced me to even care about radio in the first place. This guy on the left, Jeff Gonzer, was probably the first guy, well, that's not 100% true. I think I listened to 93KHJ. That was my first, and that was like your pop AM radio back in the 60s. But listening to 70s, growing up and getting my own identity and listening to radio, this was a classic rock station in LA. And they were very groundbreaking for the time. I didn't know how groundbreaking at the time because I was just a 13, 14 year old kid. I just thought that's how radio is. Um, but as I got to learn more, I uh, discovered how life-changing this, this team right here was for radio, uh, not just in LA, but just FM radio in general. Um, this guy, Jeff Gonzer, will tie into my story and a little bit later. Uh, he's gonna end up being my boss later on in the story. But here I'm growing up listening to this guy. Now, if we can get this video to work, I've actually got a little five-minute video which takes you back in time to the late, uh, it's like the mid-70s, and this is what radio used to be. Let's see if it'll work. Double-click, maybe? Okay, we have a picture, but we have no volume. Okay. I can like dub it, 
Coming up, we're going to talk to a local radio show. They're the FM pioneers of Los Angeles. They play outrageous rock and roll, and they are the immoral minority as opposed to the moral majority. Jeff Gonzer and his pal Ace Young. All right. Something happened. The police is taking an active part in waking up his listeners. 94.7 KMET, I'm Jeff Gonzer, and it's time for us all to wake up. Are you letting me sleep? No, no sleeping allowed. It's waking up. It's uh, about seven minutes to seven in the morning, and nobody sleeps an hour out. Once away, listeners always expect a humor aimed at the establishment. KMET has never been back about letting you know. Thank you. 
finally at Friday meetings of the immoral minority. I have never seen such rampant depravity controlled. And with that beat going on throughout the morning, even a quiet, reserved, mild-mannered reporter like this one couldn't resist kicking up his... All right, so there you go. <laughs> That's the history of radio in a nutshell. I found that video year, just maybe a couple years ago, and I was like, oh my God, just took me back to a time when DJs were still rock stars. That may never happen again, and I don't know if that even really matters. But there was something about what they were doing that I said, how can we bring that back? Radio's still here. Radio's still, as much as it may not be as popular as it used to be, it's still here. And one thing I notice, and we'll get into this a little future, but I'll just touch on it. When I talk to musicians here in this town, the minute they can get on a nonprofit radio station at three o'clock in the morning on some show that broadcasts for five blocks, and they will be on Facebook promoting the heck out of that thing, like, oh my God, we're gonna be on the radio. Everybody, listen, we're gonna be on the radio at three in the morning. So it still means something. As much as people say it doesn't, when somebody thinks they're gonna be on the radio, they want you to listen to them on the radio. So that was the inspiration, and somehow in the end, I hope to bring back a little of the magic that Jeff brought and crowd a thousand some people into a morning show place, getting drunk at six in the morning, uh, enjoying a good time. So moving on, I'm just gonna skip through the influence. Does anybody not know who Rodney on the Rock is? Might not if you're not from here, or if you're not from LA rather. They made a movie about him called Mayor of the Sunset Strip, which I highly recommend if you're at all interested in radio. This guy was one of the founding fathers of the LA music scene uh, on a station called K-Rock. He um, was famous for doing a, my wife will know better, was he at seven to midnight, a regular shift? Yeah, eventually they squished his shift down shorter and shorter. But in the, back in the day, late 70s, early 80s, he was the show to listen to in LA because he was A, very connected to the live music scene, not just to do it as a job, but he was the kind of guy, very much like myself, who just enjoys live music and enjoys finding new bands. So you see him out at the Starwood and the Whiskey and the Roxy, he'd just be standing in the back somewhere watching some band. He's a very timid little guy. Not the best DJ in the world either. He's actually got a horrible presentation, not a very good voice but everybody recognized he was real and that they, he really cared about the music scene. So he grew a huge following, um, played a lot of local bands. I used to go to the Sunset Strip on reference or recommendations from him. I'd listen to the show and he'd say, oh, here's this band, 707. I just remember the name 707 for some reason. I think that was the LAPD song I was thinking of the other day. These random one hit songs you hear on K-Rock, it's like, oh yeah, they're playing at the Roxy on Thursday. And I just like, you know, I'm gonna go see this band. He actually inspired people to go to clubs, and not only were they a new wave station, but he would talk about the rock bands like Motley Crue, when they were up and coming and nobody knew who they were, there's this new band, Motley Crue, you should check them out, they're pretty wild. So he was a guy that you would tune in and trust. Um, the end of his sad story, well actually his story isn't over yet, but in the last, I guess it was only been a few months, after all these 30, 40 years, I guess it's been on K-Rock, they dwindled them down to a Sunday night, one hour, two hour slot in the middle of the night, and they finally just got more and more corporate, and they canned him. They, and that was a big deal. Most of the rod, he was K-Rock to a lot of people. Um, now he's on Sirius. He got picked up very quickly. Um, so anyway, another major influence, somebody who's very connected in music, and somebody I kept running into years later when I was trying to do very similar to what he's trying to do. Other big influence, Howard Stern. I never, by the way, ever thought I was gonna be a radio guy. It was never a thought in my mind that I was gonna be a radio guy. Um, but I used to listen to Howard. When he first came to LA, I wasn't interested in him. Actually, my wife and I used to listen, to, we used to watch a horrible TV show on Channel 9 that he used to do in the middle, on Saturday nights, you'd come home drunk from a bar, and I'd fall and go lay in bed and turn on the TV, and we watched this guy and go, who's this idiot with the long hair? He's kind of obnoxious, but let's just watch him. And pretty soon we got kind of hooked on it. Then he came to radio in LA, he was broadcast from New York, one of the first shows, as far as I know, to be syndicated across the country. I used to listen to another, I think actually you had a Mark, you had Mark and Brian here in Portland, didn't you? Weren't they on one of the rock stations here? They were from LA as well. I used to listen to Mark and Brian. Howard Stern came to the competing station, and I remember for at least three months I used to switch back and forth just to see like the commercial break. I wonder what that Howard Stern guy sounds like. Yeah, it's not very good. He kind of talks a lot. He's kind of boring. Go back to Mark and Brian. But I started noticing at my day job, I was making eyeglasses at the time in this factory, and I just had the radio on. And every once in a while, I, I noticed that my breaks with Howard started to get longer and longer. It's like, well, I gotta hear what they were, I wanna see what he said about that thing he was talking about. I got hooked in, and pretty soon, Mark and Brian were over, and I was a, St a Stern fan. Um, if you don't know the Stern, uh, he made a great movie called Private Parts after a book he wrote. A lot of people think Howard Stern was just about strippers and trying to be outrageous and shock jock. But that wasn't what sold me on Howard. What, what worked about Howard, at least back in the day, was that he was very honest, very real, and he didn't talk like a DJ. 
No, no DJ, hey, we're going to play another song for you. He would just get talking about these random things. And they had a lot of interpersonal stuff in the station, so you got to know all the people who worked there. And you became a family with these guys. And there were, I was, at this time, I was doing delivery jobs. I'm driving around L.A. Sometimes I'd have to pull up to a stop to make a delivery, and he'd be in the middle sentence of something, and I'm like, they're going to have to wait for the delivery. I can't leave the car. I have to finish listening to this. So he got famous for getting people to listen for a long time. And most people, I mean, if you look at radio statistics, there's a thing called TSL, which is time spent listening, which is how radio stations figure out how much people are listening, then they go to advertisers, look how many people are listening and how long they're listening. It just got louder, didn't it? Sorry about that. Um, so he got large TSL. People like me, I would listen to the whole show. I'd get up 6 in the morning, that would be on, and I'd listen until he got off the air. So that's how Howard Stern inspired me there. And finally, it's this radio station, KNAC. Um, a little, they're not that small, but they were a smaller station out of Long Beach, California. Um, I was never a huge fan of KNAC, per se. They were the heavy metal rock station. They came in, they were playing Metallica and Anthrax and Slayer, music like that. But they did something really smart, and they left a huge mark when they left. They knew who their audience was. They weren't trying to be everybody's friend. Um, they catered to their audience. Hard rocking, partying, guys who want to go throw the horns up. That was their audience, and they got hugely popular. And this radio station probably meant more to me as a musician than any of the other stations, because through this radio station, we ended up getting some pretty good shows, which brings me to the next segment of my life, being in rock bands. So I jump back. I, have, I don't want to spend too much time in the rock bands, so I cut out a bunch of the photos from the different bands. But I started singing in bands in the late 70s, backyard parties, little clubs, cover tunes, eventually writing originals. This was the first band that actually, I, I, if most people have sometime in their life was a point where, they, where something kind of magical happened, like maybe things lined up for you and you said, oh, the stars were lined up and something big happened. This is one of those moments for me was this band. This was a punk band called Overkill. They were sort of mired, they were on SST Records alongside Black Flag, Circle Jerks, Minutemen. They were playing these hardcore punk shows. I was not a punk rocker. I was a glam guy. I, grew, I wanted to be, my bands were like T-Rex, Sweet, David Bowie influenced. But these guys had an advertisement up at my local college, and I saw the flyer, and I was like, I keep hearing about this band. I should just go. I called them up, and I remember saying, yeah, I'm not really a punk. And they're like, that's OK. We want a long-haired guy. We're, cha we're changing our image, so we want to meet you. So I went down. And it was nothing what I expected, not the kind of band I would have normally joined or sought out. But they were this incredibly fast punk band. But the energy in the room, I remember when I went to the audition, I was just like, oh my god, I have to be in this band. It was the best thing I'd ever heard. It's like, this is going to do something. They let me in. Um, immediately, I dyed my hair blonde. Um, started going out and getting as much leather and ripped up crap as I could to wear. Um, what I learned from this band, among other things, which is similar to what I just talked about, KNAC, know who your audience is. Focus on an audience and win big. KNAC focused on a metal audience. This band knew what they wanted. They were wanted to grow their hair out. There's another little band that was doing something very similar to us at the same time up in San Francisco called Metallica. At the same time, we were doing pretty much the same thing. Punk rock, changing it over to hard rock, blending it together. I didn't know who Metallica was. First time I heard of Metallica, I said, well, that's the stupidest band name ever. They'll never make it. A um, few bands like that I ran into in the early days. Slayer, pff, those kids are never going to go anywhere with their upside down crosses. That's so stupid. Um, we ran into lots of bands like that back in the day, and we played on bills with Rat and Wasp and a lot of the metal bands. Got pretty big. LA, LA, we got LA big, I would say. And right when I thought we had a great shot to go on tour, we broke up, and that was the end of that band. But that was what I learned from that band. And, and, on this, and through this band as well, there were some shows like this one. And if you look, as you scroll around, KMET, I guess the mouse doesn't work on here, but KMET down here is one of the stations, the rock stations, that promotes some of the shows. So our night with Rat was a KMET-sponsored night. Now these really weren't, the, the radio station didn't do a whole lot. The radio station just put their name on it, but that drew people because, oh, that's a rock station, it's a big rock station, rock night, let's go to the club. So it did help with the draw a little bit. They didn't really have any jocks show up or do anything, but to be on a KMET night made you sound cool, rock and roll. So I moved on into many bands after that. This band, Slumlord, was the one that I created. Um, and the reason I just go into this band is because that station KNAC ended up being a large part of it. The guy just, so there's me with my top hat, the guy just on the left of me or on my, on my right, that's Wences. Wences, if you're watching this, you're famous now. Wences, for his part-time gig, was what they called a phone fox at KNAC. That meant he had to volunteer to answer phones. 
So he was a phone guy there at KNAC, and we used that connection. It's like, hey, is there any KNAC nights we can get on? See if you can get us some elbows. And he was good friends with one of the D DJs, Dangerous Darren. So um, this actually wasn't a show we got through him. This was another CD release, but KNAC put their name on it. But after that, we started getting on a lot of KNAC nights. And these things, even on a Sunday or a Wednesday night, the reputation the station had would bring you a crowd. Now all you had to do was prove yourself to the crowd. So it was great for bands. And this, again, is a major inspiration for what I was hoping this radio station would do, a place where people could go and listen and then go, I want to go to a place to see these bands. So that's what KNAC did. And we got pretty good crowds. This was a KNAC night we did in Redondo Beach. Crowd, the place was packed. We didn't really have, I mean, we tried to flyer and get people to show up, but really, KNAC brought the crowd. KNAC's DJs were there. They were spinning vinyl. People were there to meet the DJs, and we were just there as entertainment. Um, did a lot of shows, more KNAC nights. And the last KNAC night that I'll, this wasn't even really a KNAC night. They had a thing called the Long Beach Chili Cook-Off. And we managed to get a side little grass, it was a little stage on the grass next to the big stage where some big rockers like the Bullet Boys and some of these bigger hair bands were playing. Well, that, so we got this through Dangerous Darren of KNAC. And as we were getting ready to play our little teeny set on the grass, the main PA blew out on the big stage. And Bullet Boys, who was the other band? Oh, Bang Tango. So they, were, they still needed to play. And so they came over to us and they go, guys, we have a problem. The PA blew out on the big stage. We need to have the big guys use your little grass stage for the rest of the show. We still want you to do your set, but can you cut it down to 20 minutes? And we're like, heck yeah. The whole crowd of people, this wall of 15, 2,000 people moved over in front of us. And that was probably the biggest audience I ever got to play in front of. I just remember the, the, the guitar player, he was kind of nervous. He looked at me, he goes, are we going to play? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, what if they crash through this little string that we got blocking? I go, then we're going to have people crashing through the thing. Turned out to be a great gig. As soon as we started playing, you start smelling weed, bikini tops were showing, and it was like, hey, party. And we partied for like it's about 20 minutes set. So all this happened because of KNAC. So now we get into radio. How the heck did I get here? Let's move on to radio finally. So I mentioned Dangerous Darren, the DJ from KNAC. Well, that band Slumlord, I'd gone through about five different incarnations of guitar players. And finally, after the last one I had to fire, we got another guy. I wasn't real happy with him. And I just decided one day it was really hard because all I really knew in life was I wanted to be a rock star. I was going to retire comfortably and live on a yacht. Uh, that wasn't going to happen. I was getting to be close to 40 years old. And I'm like, I started to kind of have a reality check. And I was like, I got to think of something to do with my life. And I really had no clue what I wanted to do. Um, it was Darren from KNAC who had just brought up in conversation one time. He's like, you should be a DJ on the radio. You can talk. You know how to yap. And I was like, well, don't you have to go to college for that? I don't know. What, how do you do that? He goes, no, you don't have to go to college. He goes, you just have to be able to make tapes. And he goes, you can already talk. So now you just have to figure out a way to make tapes. So there was this cheap rag paper in L.A. called the L.A. Weekly. And one day I noticed in the back that it said, learn to be a radio star. So I called it up, and it was this cheesy thing run by a couple of, looked like a couple of mafia guys from New York. And they say, yeah, yeah, you basically come in and use our studios. This was their high quality studios. Um, you pay them for airtime. I can't remember what it was, 20 bucks an hour or something. So basically they would give you these little sheets of paper to show you how to go A, E, I, O, U. And they give you some little exercises, which I just ignored. And they basically just gave you the, uh, the studio for an hour and you do what you want. So many things happened while I was doing that. I really wasn't sure what I was doing, but I was recording every show and listening to them and analyzing them and trying to get people to listen to them. And sometimes people would listen to them, I'd force somebody to listen. And most of the time people were like, oh yeah, that sounds great. You know, the nice thing you say, right? I finally had a boss. I was working at this job I hated. And I remember I was listening to it in the car and he goes, what are you listening to? And I go, that's, dude, listen, that's me on the radio. That's me. And he listens, he goes, oh yeah. He goes, yeah, you sound kind of droll and boring. I was like, I was so mad when he said that. But I listened back to that tape. Oh, I was horrible. I was a horrible DJ. But I was learning. And um, so through this station, there was this one time, my wife again comes into this. She bought me a gift for Christmas. Anybody who know, know who Russ Meyer is? He made these movies in the 60s with big buxom women and machine guns. And they were really B movies. So they had these soundtracks that they put out. And she bought me these soundtracks. And, I, and they just, a lot of it had just weird sounds on it or scenes from movies or really sexy music with people having sex in the background. You hear moaning and music. So I was like, oh, this is good background music for my show. So I'm playing that while I'm talking. And then this one day, it was a sound effect. It just happened to be the sounds of a hot tub. And you could hear bubbles and this girl giggling and they're toasting glasses. And then it sounds like they're having wild sex. So I'm just on the air and I started laughing when I heard it. And I was just kind of winging it. So I just started saying, yeah, well, I'm Scotty and you're in my hot tub. Welcome. Hey, grab a drink. You know, and doing the whole radio voice thing. And I forgot about it. It was just a stupid thing I did up. But um, 
eventually this hot tub idea came into real play and actually turned into a thing I used at radio stations. So I did this for about a year, making tapes in this little rinky-dink studio. And uh, I was sending tapes out. And finally, they had a big radio convention in Seattle. And I said, what the heck else have I got to do? I'll take some tapes up there and some little you know, things about me and meet some people. And I met two people at that convention, because what I did was I, I got all dressed up in this long brown leather jacket and my high boots. And I walked in there with my hair down, all rock and roll. And they had this little thing where they introduction to welcome everybody, and does anybody have any questions? And I just stood up, so I have a question. And I just figured I'll make myself very public here. So I go, hi, I'm new, I've never been in radio, I have no schooling, I have never been to college for this, um, but I've got some tapes, and I think I'm pretty good, and I wanna work, so if anybody's looking for a new DJ, I am ready to be your slave. Two people came up to me. One was a woman from Cape Cod who said, oh, we might have an opening, and would you move to Cape Cod? And I'm thinking, where the heck's Cape Cod? I know it's not close to LA, but okay. And finally, this other guy came up to me, and he goes, you don't want to go move all the way to Cape Cod. He goes, I live in Ridgecrest. I'm like, where's that? Oh, the Mojave Desert. You're like three hours from LA. You're right in between Vegas and LA. It's like the gold mine of lifestyle. It's awesome, right? <laughs> so I give him my stuff. He goes, call me in a couple weeks. Well, I played phone tag with this guy for a few weeks. And finally, he took a call and said, yeah, I'll have you come out for an interview. They told me later, the girls who worked there, they said he was going to take you. He was just trying to torture you for like a month. He's like, oh, I'm going to hire the guy. I just want to make sure he's serious. So my first radio job, my first paying radio job, was in Ridgecrest, California at IROC, a teeny weeny little rock station owned by one guy in this little town called Ridgecrest. And it was in the Mojave Desert. The closest town was the town of Mojave, which is a population 300 or something. And you had to drive an hour and a half from that to get to Ridgecrest. First, I had no idea why anybody would live in this little hole out in the middle of the desert. Turned out there was a military base there. And so it was military and just people who were families of military mostly. So I had the little planes doing their you know, exercises while I was doing my morning show. I didn't know what I was doing, um, but this guy taught me how to work the equipment, how to set a clock, which is what you do on radio. Everything's in a clock. So I was like, I had to learn how to do things, give me little tests and things to do. And uh, eventually he started giving me freedom to try and do things. So I started producing little ads, making the, I made a commercial for the screening of The Matrix, which is this new movie in town. And so I just made this really stupid commercial, and I did my really worst Keanu Reeves impression. Hey, I'm Keanu Reeves. You've seen me in these movies. And I did this really lame, little jokey commercial, which everybody ended up liking. So then I got passionate about producing and making weird commercials. Worked there for maybe eight months. I'll shorten the story a little by saying it didn't end real good. Um, what happened was he was encouraging me, because it was we're talking a little tiny town in the middle of the desert. There was probably 50 churches in this town, and I think there was 100 people that lived there, so you do the math, there was like just mostly churches there and a military base. Um, so in a way, he thought he wanted to shake the town up with this new morning show at this rock station. And so finally, one day, I created this, I, was just, I had this old skit that I'd done at the practice studio. I go, I used to have this skit I did called the Jesus Christ action figure, which actually was funny because years later, if, I'm sure if you've probably seen them in stores, they have the Jesus Christ action figure now. I should get money from that because I thought of that way before that toy came out. I had a little skit that I came up with, and it was just like, get your Jesus Christ action figure. He's got his razor-sharp crown of thorns. He throws at the bad guys, and he comes with sandals and a robe, you know? So I had this little skit, and he goes, oh, that's really funny. Yeah, you should make that and put it on the air. And he goes, and then listen in. Let me know how many people call in with hate calls. He was very excited about this. So I put it on the next morning. Nobody called. Nobody called. They played the skit, went into some music. Phone didn't ring, nothing. Boss shows up about a half hour later. So did we get a lot of calls? And he was, I was like, actually, no, nobody seemed offended by it at all, or they weren't listening, one of the two. He's like, oh, that's disappointing. He goes, well, try it again tomorrow. Okay. So tomorrow, he goes, try it at a different time tomorrow, like earlier. Okay. So the next day, I played the same skit again. And I'm doing my show, and the boss shows up in a little while, and he says, he comes walking in, he goes, I have to have a talk with you. Okay. So we go to his desk. Okay, I'm sitting at the desk. Of course, the chair I had was lower than his, so I had to look up at him. He was a short guy, so. Um, he goes, um, yeah, I just have to say that we got a call. Um, it was from a local pastor who I'm very good friends with, and I do not want to offend him, so uh, never play that skit again. And he started reprimanding me, and I go, well, I just, I started laughing. He goes, uh, Scott, this isn't funny. This is a, a job, and this is not just goofing around. I go, okay, I only played it because you told me to. Um, and he goes, no more, don't do anything that could offend anybody. Let's, I want you to tone back on everything you've been doing. Just talk about the music. And, and I was just like, and then I was sitting in there the next morning, I remember thinking, this is the worst job, I hate this job. Why am I even here? I don't even like living here. Um, and so from there, it went pretty quickly downhill. And I remember one day, as I recall the conversation, it went something like, 
well, you can just do it my way or you can quit. And I went, I quit. <laughs> so that was the end. Went back home to Long Beach. And then I was busy looking for more radio jobs. And this is where I found probably the most educational radio job ever in the Bible Belt of Kansas. One thing I learned about radio, and you, you know, I don't get to talk to, one day I kind of hope that maybe I can talk to classrooms full of aspiring radio talent. Um, they teach them a lot of things about how to be a radio person and what you're supposed to do. I think the one thing that needs to be talk, told to anybody aspiring to get into radio, if you really think you're going to make it anywhere in radio, one thing you have to be able to do, move. And most people don't want to do that. I knew a lot of people in L.A. that were doing the little freebie radio like I was. We're saying, oh, I'm just going to keep doing this until somebody here in L.A. picks me up. L.A. is market number two. Good luck. Um, so I learned very quickly that if you wanted to go and be in this business, you had to be able to sacrifice and move. Liberal Kansas was the most least liberal place I've ever lived in my life. Um, I found out later it was named liberal because back in the old Western days, the guy had a big well who lived there, and when horses would come through, he was very extra helpings with the water for the horses, and they'd think, well, that's mighty liberal of you. So that's how they came up with the name Liberal Kansas. It was right on the border of Oklahoma and Texas, Tornado Alley, and the Bible Belt. I went to the interview, freaked out when I met my new boss, who was a guy who smoked cigarettes in the car with the windows up and had one big missing tooth in the, in the front. How you doing? Oh, you're going to love it here. We have a lot of fun. We drink a lot of beer. It's going to be a lot. You'll like it here in Kansas. Oh, my God. Went to the interview, and uh, they liked me. And then I sat there and pondered and cried and freaked out for a couple of days and kept calling my wife and going, I don't know if we can do this, and I don't think I can do this, and I want to do it, but the job seems good, and they're going to teach me everything, and they had pretty nice facilities. This is, 19, this is 2001 or two. They had pretty nice gear. I mean, they were pretty state-of-the-art for this little town that we were in. Um, so I took the job, and I learned more about radio than I have anywhere. Um, my main boss, program director, ended up quitting but my, the owner or the general manager became my boss, Terry Miller. Terry Miller was this old hippie who had kind of cleaned up a little bit and moved back to Kansas. But during, back in the day, he had been a relatively major DJ. He would worked in some big markets like Dallas. Would tell me stories about how back in the day, oh yeah, radio was different. Stevie Ray Vaughan just showed up at the studio one time. It's eight in the morning and we did coke off the table while we were interviewing him and just, you know, orgies and getting in trouble with his wife and all this stuff. This is the radio rock star dream that he lived. Now he's in Hugot, or in this little town in Kansas and he's my boss. So I started learning more and more about working the equipment and he gave us these little meetings, which I've talked, I'm still friends with this guy. Um, he told me, this lady goes, I wasn't really doing much. I was just reading out of a book. I go, yeah, but you did because you inspired us. We learned one key element and probably the one major lesson I learned uh, more than any from him, which any radio pro will tell you anyway, is it's all about the listener. That was the key thing I had to learn from day one. It's all about the listener. So if what you're doing, if you think it's entertaining and nobody's entertained, it's not about you, it's about the listener. Um, and by using that motto, we did great, and I had a lot, I ended up with a lot of friends, I really thought I was gonna get my butt kicked in like maybe the first day or two that I moved there. Ended up doing fine, nobody ever picked a fight with me even though I was the only long hair in town. Um, made a lot of friends, and even over the time I was there, I met some people who had, they had a rock station that they could listen to, and they would say, no, no, we don't listen to the rock station until after you're off the air. Everybody, they would say, I don't care, I was playing Christina Aguilera, Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys, Nothing that I liked, but I didn't care. I was playing music and I was having fun in between the songs, taking a lot of phone calls, and people would tell me like, oh yeah, no, we listen to you every morning. And so I, I had the buzz and it was working. Um, I learned a lot more about production and we started, me and my buddy who I hired on there. This, let me just do a quick little, I'll, I was gonna pass by this, but I'll just run through this quickly. Because one day I hope to be in a position to hire my own DJs. Um, I got a guy in there who was a perfect fit for the station. He had never done anything to do with radio. He was the local guy who worked at a lumber yard. Just a kid that worked at a local lumber yard who liked the radio station. And I got to meet him. He had this infectious laugh, and he was funny. And we were looking for a DJ, and the boss was having a hard time finding someone to move to Kansas. And I said, can, I, can we take a chance on somebody? And he goes, who? And I go, there's a guy who wants to do it. If you, I'll train him. I'll show him how to work all the equipment. I think he'd be good. He got in, and in the end, he ended up being super popular, and he ended up moving to Missouri and getting a job near Joplin, and he did pretty good for a while. Um, I found that the best talent isn't necessarily radio skill talent. It's people, people who fit and get what you're trying to do. Um, so I learned a lot at the station. I made a lot of stars out of listeners. A local guy named Farm Boy Brian used to call me in every day. It took him about a month to get to know me. Pretty soon, every morning, like clockwork, here's Farm Boy Brian on the phone. Yeah, and he, wanted to hear, so he always wanted to hear some song that nobody wanted to hear. 
I tease him for a while, and then I wrote a, I wrote a theme song for him, and I recorded the theme song. So every day it's time for, and he was a star. Pretty soon he'd come up meet me at these remote broadcasts, and like, everybody knows me now, Scott. Everybody's like, that's Bomboy Brian. I heard your song on the radio today. Making stars with the listeners. Okay, so my radio education is moving on. Kansas lasted two years until I finally figured I was going to have to hang myself if I stayed there one more day because I just couldn't live there anymore. Um, and plus 9-11 had happened between this time, so now flying back to L.A. to see my wife every three weeks was getting harder and harder because the, sometimes I couldn't even catch the flight because of the security. So I just said one day, I was like, I, you know, thanks for all the education. i got to move back to L.A. I'll figure something out. And then we moved on to interviewing blow-up dolls. So my next job was my most short-lived radio job. I guess most short-lived. Idaho, another, maybe my second least favorite place that I had to live. I'm sure there's nice parts of Idaho, but Pocatello wasn't so great. Uh, I took the job for one reason. Somebody, you know somebody in Pocatello? No, I just read this book. <laughs> About Pocatello? Yeah, Pocatello. <laughs> yeah. So, lots of trains. there's lots of trains, yes. Um, I wasn't going to take this job. As a matter of fact, when we went to the interview, I remember th telling, I was like, no, this is not going to happen, but we'll be nice. Um, the boss took us out to dinner, and the boss was this really nice guy who says, you know, I know this probably isn't where you really want to live. He goes, where do you want to end up in radio? What's your goal? He goes, I think you can do really well. You got a great sound. Where do you want to end up? And I go, somewhere in the Northwest. Seattle, Portland would be my first choices. He goes, well, I can tell you this. I've been in the business a long time. I have friends who work in Seattle and Portland. If you give me two years of your life, he goes, and you still want to move, I will start putting in calls to my friends and get you work on the, on the, the West Coast. That was the clincher. I took the job. And then the sad part. One week, less than a week after I'd taken the job, he's going on a road trip, or he's going to take a flight somewhere. So every time before he'd take a flight, my boss, Neil, would go for a mountain bike ride up in the hills. And that day, like every other day, he put on his helmet and got on his little bike, and he was riding along the hills, and he hit some bump wrong, flipped the bike upside down, landed on his head, helmet split in half. He ended up paralyzed from the neck down. His wife left him, and shortly after, the company let him go, and he was in a hospital. And I had a new boss. <laughs> and everything that I'd been promised or was dreaming of was sort of like, uh, what happens now? And I really didn't know if I should even bring it up. So I went and actually saw Neil, my old boss, in the hospital. And I brought it up. I go, I don't want to be insensitive, but what happens to me now? And he goes, he goes, no, I know this new guy. He's a good guy. He goes, I think you should talk to him about your goals. He can probably help you get in there too. So I brought it up to him. His response was nearly not so friendly. It was like, oh, well, we want people who want to stay here and live here. So about a month or two go by, and finally he comes in one day, and he goes, well, we have another guy who wants to move here, so um, we're going to give you a two-week notice, and then you're done. Oh. So that was the end of it. So this is when I learned how fickle the radio business was. I was like, okay, you could be doing great, but it doesn't really matter. But fortunately, there was a, really, there was a bright point to this story, and this is how I discovered the Northwest, because I never lived in the Northwest in my life, ever. But I had a friend who worked at the radio station. My month, I had a month of rent already paid. We really weren't sure what we were going to do. Here we are in Idaho. We got nothing. I won't have a job in a minute. And I got a month's rent paid on this house. Where are we going to go? I had no clue what we were going to do. And my friend goes, well, as long as you've got some time off, you should go up to Seattle area. As a matter of fact, there's this little town called Bellingham. Anybody know Bellingham? If you've ever been there, I think it's very much like a small version of Portland. That's what I thought of it. Aside from the fact they have an ocean, a lot of restaurants, a lot of cool music, groovy people, college, really cool area. So we ended up stumbling into Bellingham, and I, while I was there, I go, I might as well just go to the radio station. I think I called ahead. I said, okay, can I just come and meet you? I'm sure you don't have any openings, but yeah, you can come up and meet me. So I went up, met her, met my, who was going to become my new boss. Literally, the interview was sort of like, she goes, well, if you want to try out, you know, are you here for a couple days? I go, I don't have anywhere to go. She goes, you want to come in on Saturday afternoon and do a show, and then we'll just give it a listen? Sure. So I did that. She called me up that night. We had a, a hotel room in Seattle. And she called me and she says, well, we've decided that we really like you, but we don't have any time slots available unless you want to go on from midnight to six in the morning. And I was like, I'll take it. She goes, I can't pay you very good. I'll take it. It's only part time. I'll take it. And she goes, I'll try to give you as many slots. Whenever somebody's sick, you can fill in. Take it. So I ended up in Washington, Bellingham, KISM. There's my little head peeking out the back over there. A couple of these people are still at this station, believe it or not. Well, that's just very uncommon in radio. Turnaround's very common. Um, KISM was a classic rock station. One of the first things that really attracted me to them and the city was the first night I went for the interview, they said, oh, you should come out. We're doing a KISM Battle of the Bands tonight. And I go, really? And they go, yeah, it's local bands, and we're going to be the judges. 
and we're going to give away a prize to get a recording thing for it. And I was like, oh, that's great. They're supporting local music. And I just come from two towns, three places actually, where there was no live mu local music scene. Boring. You know, you're lucky if you get a bad cover band at the casino. So I was like, okay, I'm in a town where there's music and they're having battle of the bands and the radio. This is fantastic. What was really depressing, and I won't name the jock in person just in case he watches this video for some reason, but I remember sitting there next to the judges while this band was playing, and all he kept doing was grumbling and going, oh, missing the game. There was a game on, and he wanted to watch the game. And he was forced to come to this thing, and he was upset that he had to be there because he wanted to watch the game. And as a matter of fact, in between doing the bands, he's like, by the way, anybody who cares, the score is 17 to 9. You know, he was so disgruntled. I'm like, is this, you guys don't know how good you have it. You have this great signal. The signal went all the way into Seattle and up into Vancouver, Canada. So they had this great signal, and they had this opportunity to do something huge. I just didn't think they were doing everything they could have with it. So I worked there often. I was working overnights, fill-ins in the mornings, fill-ins in the middays, fill-ins in the afternoons. I filled in pretty much every shift. Whenever they had an opening, I'll do it. Um, but after a couple years, I was starting to realize I wasn't going to get a full-time job. But they had this AM station that wasn't doing anything. They're playing oldies or classical or something on it. And I remember just thinking, wouldn't it be nice to do something with this? And in this time I'd been in Bellingham, I got really immersed in the music scene. Lots of little local bands just like here. And um, I was going out and meeting these bands and I got to know these bands. And as a matter of fact, when I did a fill in for the New Year's Eve show, or the week of New Year's Eve, I filled in for the morning show. Um, I, I, got, I convinced, it was hard to convince the salespeople because they wanted money for everything. But I said, look, this is promoting local stuff. I, how about I have one club owner from each club come in each day of the week up to New Year's and they can talk about who's going to play at their club and we could even get the bands on maybe and play a little of their music. So they allowed me to do that. Um, but so anyway, they had this AM station and we had this idea, my wife and I, for this thing called Bellingham Radio Revolution. And the idea was that kids now, radio's starting to get old, right? They've all got these new things called iPods and stuff, right? So we started talking about AM radio, and I go, what if AM's the new revolution? What if AM is so different to them, they would probably turn on AM, why would they? What if AM, all of a sudden, you found all the coolest music? What if AM, all local bands and maybe old punk rock that you, who cares what the quality is, right? It's old punk rock, cassette tapes. Play old punk rock and local bands and talk about local gigs and put it on the AM signal. So instead of just asking if I can do it, we just decided to kind of put together a little brochure and try to sell it. So my wife did most of the work getting the font together and putting everything together and a little package about what it was about. And then I spent the next few days just walking around Bellingham and any place that had band flyers in the window, I'd walk in. Hey, do you support local music? Yeah. How would you feel about a radio station that supported local bands and played local vi and supported local gigs? Sounds fantastic. What would be worth, to, would you be willing to sponsor something like this? Because I knew they wanted money. So I, what, would you be willing, let's say, what if it was $20 a month for a mention like at least twice a week? or something, they go, you know, yeah, it'd be great. And we had these ideas, like we, the burritos place, this burrito place had all the flyers on the wall. I went in there and I said, what if every time we did a show, we have this time during lunchtime where we call you up and it's like, okay, for listening right now, the next five people get what? And they could sell whatever kind of burrito for half price, anything. And they're like, this is a great idea. I would be totally in on this. And most of the people, when I started talking to them, they will also say, you know, the, this station, they have salespeople come in here all the time, but we just kick them out the door because they don't even talk about what the product is. They just walk in and go like, so we got some great rates. You want to check out the rates? What do you want to buy? Like without even saying, well, what am I buying? Oh, you're going to be on our radio station. What's on your radio station? Some jocks and music that nobody really likes that much. You want to advertise there? I had a product they actually wanted to advertise for. So I went around and I ended up, if I recall, I, we had over 50 businesses that were like, yes, and they signed. Like, I would love to get involved in this. I would be willing to sponsor this. So I was so proud of this package. I go, you know, that's like, you know, several hundred bucks a month or more just for me to going around, walking around doing it myself. Went in there to the owner and he looked at it and he went, wow, what a presentation. Oh, you've really been doing your homework on this. My goodness, well, God, this really, wow, okay, uh-huh. But, but AM radio is for oldies or classical or talk. But thanks for doing all that work. They just, it was just, there was no out of the box. This is how, this is AM, AM is that. AM can't be that, it's not that, it's gotta be this. So that was the end of it. So there I am in Bellingham, and finally I get a job offer back in my home of LA, which we didn't wanna go back to, because after living in the Northwest, I did not wanna go back to Los Angeles. Yuck, you can have it, I'm done with it. I was there when it was fun, I don't wanna go back. But there was a job offer in Palmdale, which is this little desert community outside of LA. And they wanted me there, and they wanted me for a morning show, and the money was decent. So I took the job. This job was very helpful because I was back in a big market now. And 
my new boss, Xander. Hey, Xander, if you're watching. Xander and I fought a lot, but Xander taught me a lot. <clears throat> I think it was my second or third week there on the morning show. He goes, all right, I have a mission for you. I go, okay, what is it? He goes, I want you to get at least one celebrity interview on this show per week. Well, how, how do I do that? He goes, I don't know. Go in the yellow pages, go online, whatever you got to do. What do I kind find? He goes, I don't know, just see what you can do. We'll try to get, he goes, I want to work it up to you getting an interview every day. How do I, I don't have celebrity phone numbers. How do I do this? It started slowly. I, somehow I think there was a, somebody had a book, a celebrity had a book out, so I wrote to the book company. Can we get so-and-so to call in about, the, I think it was Andy Summers of the police, might have been one of the first ones. And he had a book that he wrote. And uh, sure enough, they said, yeah, Andy can get you. They find out you're in an L.A. market within the L.A. listening range, and you're, like, interested. So suddenly I was getting celebrity interviews. So I have a long list of celebrity interviews that I got through, and it was just because he encouraged me to give it a shot. Um, I never thought I would actually be in that position, but I got everybody from Alice Cooper to Tommy Chong to anybody who's coming through basically was promoting on the station. So I got really good at that. The midday host, who actually was never in the building from her home, the midday host was a guy named Jeff Gonzer, who you might remember from the beginning of this whole presentation. He was the old morning show, KMET, the founding father of FM radio. Why is he doing a midday pre-recorded show and making me the morning show? He's the legend. I'm just some guy who just moved here. Oh, he likes to work out of his house. He has another thing on the side. He works for another company. And one day, Jeff Gonzer gets to know me after a while. He comes up to a couple events. We get to know each other. And one day, he says, oh, you know, I have another radio station. And I like to, he goes, would you be interested in doing a show on the weekends? Well, what is it? All we'll do an all-request show Saturday nights. It'll be syndicated in like 40 markets across the country. You'll be taking calls from all over the country. Yeah, I'd like to do that. <laughs> so there's Jeff on the left, aged a little bit. There's Rob Halford from Judas Priest. There's me looking kind of, I don't know what my face is I'm making there. And that was Tony Scott, who still works at KLOS, one of the major stations in LA. This was the best radio job ever. Paid me great, gave me great benefits. And every Saturday night, I loved, I did not care giving up my weekends. Five o'clock in the afternoon, I would get there, punch in, and go live and say, all right, we're taking requests. It's an all request hot tub show. By the way, you know, I, I kind of skipped over the radio hot tub thing. I kind of skipped over one of the best parts of the story. I should, let me just backtrack real quickly. Radio hot tub was born back there in liberal Kansas as a joke, which we never thought would work because we were in the Bible Belt. But the boss had gone out of town, and me and the program director were there. And on Sunday night, we were having a beer. And he goes, by the way, we never figured out what to call your show. And as a joke, I said, how about Scotty's hot tub? Because I told him about the old hot tub thing. He goes, that would go over really good in the Bible Belt, sarcastically. He goes, you should make it dirtier, like, Uncle Scotty's hot tub. And then we kind of went to bed and never agreed on it. So the next morning, I just went for it. And I remember he showed up. He goes, you actually went Uncle Scotty's hot tub? How many hate calls did you get? None. Matter of fact, people start calling up. And the, the call, like, people would start calling in. It's like, hey, I want to get in the hot tub. People got it. People knew it wasn't sleazy. People knew it was nothing wrong with it. It's just funny. So pretty soon, I had every single person calling in. Hey, how do I get in the hot tub? So anyway, that was, I, I backtracked a little. Now we're back in LA. And I've got Uncle Scotty's hot tub here on Dial Global syndicated in about 40 markets. I'm, calling, I'm talking to people from Kentucky and upper state New York and everywhere in between the country calling in to ask for George Thorogood or Kiss or whatever band they wanted to hear. Love this job. And so now I've got a morning show just outside of LA, Monday through Friday, and I've got this job on Saturday nights. We're actually making pretty good money, living in Studio City. And as much as I hated LA, it's like, hey, we're doing pretty good. We're living in a good part of LA. Things are working out pretty good. Until one day Jeff comes in and goes, did you hear about the merger? You go, what's a merger? <laughs> Dial Global is going to merge with another big company. And half of the jocks are going to get moved out because everybody has the same format and the same amount of jocks. And I looked at him, I go, well, no one's going to get rid of you. You're Jeff Gonzer. He goes, we're all expendable. He goes, I'm just letting you know if something could happen. So about a month before Christmas, Jeff walks in and he goes, I think you're doing a great job and you don't have to worry. You've got a lot of fans. They're not going to get rid of you. Jeff, they let you go? Yeah, I'm done. Really? So now Jeff is gone, and he goes, you're going to be fine. You have enough standalone markets. They're not going to get rid of you. I thought that was true until about right before Christmas when they walked in, and they go, you've been doing a great job, Scott, nothing personal. So most of the jobs I've been let go from, actually, it wasn't any fault of my own. It was just luck of the straw, or we need to cut back this much money on the budget, which is what happened at that job in Palmdale, the other morning show job. A month later, I think after this job, as I already called the way it went, we lost, I lost this job, ended right around New Year's Eve, had some vacation time, so we went to Las Vegas for a week, like, let's take a break, go to Vegas, went and had some fun in Vegas, came back from the trip, and the first day back at my morning show job, they pulled me in the office. 
after my show, of course, after my show's done. Scott, and it was one of these, we're really sorry to say goodbye. You couldn't even look me in the eye. I'm like, oh, you're kidding me. I just lost two jobs in a month. So now I'm out of work, and I'm in LA, and my rent's pretty expensive, and I have no idea what I'm gonna do. But KNAC, that big rock station, they'd gone off the air years before, but they were now streaming online. They couldn't pay me anything, but they had these studios in Hollywood, and they had a large audience who still wanted to listen to their heavy metal, and so KNAC.com actually had a pretty fair amount of listeners. So I called him, I talked to the guy, and he goes, Scott, he goes, he goes it's volunteer. He goes, nobody wants to go in there in the morning. I go, I'm your new morning show. I'll go in Monday through Friday. Really? Yeah. I'll just, till I find a job. He goes, great. And since I'm in Hollywood, I was able to get anybody coming through locally. I had to get porn stars because, well, there was an adult con happening, right? So you had to get porn stars. We had a webcam, so of course listeners wanted to look on the webcam. I could pretty much do whatever I want on there. It was internet, so I didn't have to censor anything I said or did. Um, and actually had a lot of fun, and I learned how to use a chat room. I was like, oh, hey, I can't use phones in here, but I got this chat room, and I carry on outrageous conversations with listeners. It was a lot of fun, but I wasn't making any money, and right before my unemployment ran out, and I was doing this, I had no idea where I could find a radio job, and I'd kind of given up on the United States because everybody was consolidating, and people were getting fired, and nobody was offering any money. It was like money was getting like minimum wage. Um, but Canada was looking. So they treated me like a king when I showed up in Canada. They finally got me. It took about three months or four months of paperwork to get accepted, to get up there because of all the you know, legal stuff. <coughs> but Grand Prairie, Alberta, Canada, where it's minus 40 degrees for most of the year. And when it's not minus 40, it's three months of really hot and lots of mosquitoes. Um, oil rigs around there. So a lot of people have money because they work in the oil rigs. And then they come and blow all their money and get drunk and watch hockey. So it was this little town out there. But it was another chance to get back in the game. They welcomed me great. They had signs all over town, gave me a big buildup. And I ended up very quickly becoming one of the bigger, like there was really only one other rock station. And I suppose some people would say the other guy had more listeners, but everybody told me that I was the one stealing all the listeners. So things went really good. We're up there in the beautiful mountains. Well, that actually wasn't, the town didn't really look like that. That was the town over where we did that. But Free FM, I worked there for a couple years. Actually started thinking about becoming a dual citizen, started filling out paperwork about trying to become a half Canadian citizen. Hey, maybe Canada's the place for me. And, um, but I didn't like Alberta, and it was really cold, and it was a little bit redneck for me. And they had stations on Vancouver Island, and I said, you know, if you want to keep me with the company, which they did, I said, I want you to get me on Vancouver Island. I would be more like the Northwest again. So they got me to Campbell River, Vancouver Island, which probably has more animals than people, but it's beautiful. We, had a, we got this home, and they paid me the same money. So I was, I won't go over my salary, but just suffice it to say, I was the most money I ever made. It's pretty good money. And I was able to afford this beautiful condo overlooking the ocean where the whales would go by, and we had the eagles in the trees, and the deer were running around everywhere, and it was just paradise. Not much to do, but who cares? You had the ocean and the cruise ships going by at night. It was beautiful. So I worked at 99.7 The River, and this is where my radio, paying radio career ended, at least for now. Um, the new boss who went through a lot of trouble to get over there, I discovered very quickly we didn't agree on a lot of things. And one of the main things was he was a salesman trying to play the program director role. Um, sales and programming generally don't mix. And so anything I said, he didn't hear it as a bit to get listeners going, hey, that's really entertaining. He heard, could that get rid of a list or could that possibly cancel a client, a future client? I was just trying to be local one day, and there was this smelly part of the ocean about a mile up, but this little section always smelled kind of like rotten eggs. And one of the locals is like, everybody knows that part. Nobody goes up there. That's where the algae or whatever from something or other makes that smell. So one day on the air, I was just trying to be conversational. I said, yeah, I was talking to some people last night at the bonfire, and we were talking about the algae part of the town. It's like, you know, hey, it's beautiful up there. Just hold your breath. My, this guy shows up and got fear, pulled me in the office. What are you doing? Do you know we have possible clients up there? I go, we have clients? Possible clients could possibly want to invest in this station, but now if they heard you call their beach stinky, why would they invest any money? So it got worse from there, and within about a month or so, I came into the show, and they came in and they said, this came down from the top. Nice working with you. Bad judgment call. I talked about the ocean. So here I am. Now we're finally getting to Radio Hot Tub. How long has it been? Have I been talking on for like two hours already? Feels like it. No? Am I good? It's only been an hour? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom through Radio Hot Tub as quick as I can. And you're being very great. You're being a great crowd, great crowd. Give yourself a round of applause. Give yourself a round of applause. Okay. 
so how did, how did Radio Hot Tub get to Portland? Well, I've always wanted to live in Portland. My sister's been here for like 30 years, regular visitor here, but never lived here. My wife and I are up there in Canada. The work feast is running out. We don't have any prospects. There's nobody hiring for radio jobs. And she's been following me around to these various towns with just wherever she, she had to get jobs at random places because there's no jobs there. So I said, honey, why don't we go somewhere we both just want to live? Where do you want to, and what are we going to do when we get there? I don't know. But where do we want to live? So honestly, our first choice was Bellingham, but there's no jobs there. So we said, Portland. We got friends. We got family. It's beautiful. Let's move to Portland. When I first moved to Portland, I started going out to see musicians, going out to some clubs, and I started asking musicians when I go, because I, I just naturally have gravitated to clubs, and there's so many here in Portland. If you're into live music, you know this. So I was going to these clubs, and I started meeting musicians, and I started asking musicians, I go, what radio station here is the best for you? Who's promoting you? And they were talking about this station called X-Ray, who I realized was just here a few weeks ago at the Hand Eye Supply. Um, so I volunteered board op. I said, yeah, I said, I can produce commercials for you. I can give you a dynamite show. I will be happy to volunteer. All they really had was board op duties for the Tom Hartman show. So I was just basically pushing buttons in the morning. I did that for about a year. Um, I was also, eventually I said, look, if you want me to produce commercials, I have a home studio. So they, they were doing a little, but they, I just felt they were underutilizing me. So after a while, I just decided, you know what, I'm going to do it on my own. So Radio Hot Tub. I actually technically started this internet station when I was in Canada and out of work. I was playing classic rock, but not the classic rock that the stations play. I was playing all deep cuts because I said we need an alternative classic rock. Still another station I dream of building one day is another kind of classic rock station, which would be a whole new classic rock to the, opposed to the boring classic rock. So it was, I had that, but when I got here, I started slowly saying, well, I'll incorporate a few local bands into the mix. So for a while there, it was about 30% local bands, 80% or 70% classic rock. And as I started meeting more bands and adding more music, it got to 50-50. And now it's 100% local bands all day, every day. So these are, the little fly these are the first flyers we started putting up on the telephone poles. And then some of the bands said, hey, how would you like to host a Radio Hot Tub night? Just show up and put your you know, banner up, which I didn't really have yet. But I said, sure, I'll come out. So we started doing Radio Hot Tub nights. Different bands started having me on the, you know, just show. And in the beginning, I don't do this anymore, but in the beginning, I was playing Celebrity Guy, and I'd come up and introduce every band. Hey, let's give a round of applause to When We Met. And you can hear these guys on Radio Hot Tub. After a while, I started getting a few people going, yeah, I think some people think you're a little cocky by doing that. So I said, all right, I'm just going to pull back. Just be there. I'll just be the guy hosting the event. So we did a bunch of Radio Hot Tub Nights, everywhere from Cartlandia at the food carts, did a whole bunch of shows with different bands. And we've been doing these now for over two and a half years. The, the mix of rock I play is pretty diverse. If it fits in a rock category, it could be acoustic, indie, dark, gothic, metal, in the, you know, funky, it's a pretty wide array. I don't have any country, I don't have any country western, and I don't have any hip hop, but pretty much all the rock in between, psychedelic, it's all in there. So we started putting together all these shows, interviewing the bands. This gentleman right here on the left, AJ, he was a fan who just heard the station and, and got a hold of me and said, how do I get involved? I wanna help out. I wanna find out about this, I've been listening, and I wanna, he met me at a show that he heard about on the radio. So he said, hey, I film stuff. So he came out and started being my cameraman. He doesn't do it all the time, but he's helped me out quite a bit. So here I am filming one of the bands at one of the shows. We started filming a lot of the bands, putting up a YouTube channel, which I'll show you at the end here, interviewing different bands. That's Breaker Breaker. And then here's just several of the different kinds of bands, all girl band called Rilla. They just did their record release last week. Um, that's The Night, a local punk band. This is a band called Patrimony. Now they're known as AKA Faceless. We do a lot of shows at the Firkin Tavern. It's just anybody never been to the Firkin? Just a little dive bar over here on the east side. It's a cool little dive bar. It's always free. The shows go from 7 to 10. Uh, they pay the bands. So it's a win-win for everybody. So I like doing shows there. And plus, you don't have to get 1,000 people in the room to make it look good. You can pack the Firkin with 25 or 30 people and have a good night out of it. Um, darker gothic bands like Die Robot. There's Stein. I think that's Tammy's favorite band, Stein. I think you were at this show, Tammy. Uh, Dad Works Hard, one of my favorite local bands, very funky 70s style band. It's the Pining Hearts. Kivit Bednar, the guy over here on the left, is the first musician I met when I moved here. He was playing at the Firkin Solo. And I just got to be like, this guy can play the blues. I got to get to know this guy. We've become friends ever since. And then we started, uh, this is one of the last shows we did. This is a band called Foxy Lemon, who's got a pretty big draw here now. Um, we did this at the Good Foot, got a really good crowd at this show. And we finally got a logo. This was drawn by a guy named Nori who plays in a band called Cambrian Explosion. 
I told him, I said, for 250 bucks, come up with anything you want, because I knew he did groovy art. I said, just come up with something that has a hot tub and headphones. So this is what he came up with, the space guy with a PBR and a bong, drinking in a spaceship that doubles as a hot tub. It may not be the logo forever, but I like it. It's pretty cool, and people just tend to want the, the logo on themselves, which is why I thought it was cool. So now there's Kivit wearing his Radio Hot Tub shirt, and a guy from the Toads wearing his, and a guy from Brother Man wearing his Radio Hot Tub shirt. So we got the merch. And then finally, I'm just gonna wrap it up with a, a little video. And, but uh, the Willamette Week, they do their best of. I never took this to believe that, hey, I am the best. This just means who can get more people to actually take the time to go type in and vote on these things. But I thought it was pretty cool. What, what really got me for this is that we got nominated for Best Radio Personality and Best Local Radio Show. None of the other stations are internet stations. All these guys have got radio signals, they have budgets, they have volunteers, they have all this stuff, and they weren't able to get enough people to go and type in and vote, which tells me that they're just not trying very hard. Um, I'm trying hard. So in the end, I have Radio Hot Tub. It streams 24-7, local bands. Um, I'm live whenever I can be. When I'm not live, I try to make it sound like it's live by pre-recording stuff. I'm always talking about local shows, what bands are coming up, where you can see them. And we do Radio Hot Tub Nights, so I'll wrap up by showing a video, if we got volume, um, of one of our Radio Hot Tub Nights. normally don't do I, I need to sleep in on the weeknights but tonight was a freaking amazing night I'll tell you more but here's how it started with the pining hearts let me tell you a quick story about this man you see before you first of all you can tell he's beautiful <laughs> Now, what you may not know yet is that he's talented, too. He can sing, he can play guitar, he can write songs. He's kind of fun to be around, and he's the first musician I met in Portland when I moved here That's a couple true. of years ago. That's crazy. I've seen you with every incarnation. Yeah. Tell me what the Pining Hearts have. This one, I can lean back a lot more. I got a lot of good musicians with me where I can sort of like, you know, they'll, they'll take the reins and drive it where they want to, and that's really nice. They usually take it somewhere really cool. But what do you do with, I mean, you're a musician. You must have a huge ego. How do you let it play off oh, all yeah. these other guys? Well, I, most people think it's really nice to, like, stay down on earth and, like, you know, be humble and stuff. But, no, I make sure I stroke that ego nice and hard every day. Final question from thousands of listeners who need to know who does the hair. I do. Give it Bednar of the Pining Hearts on Radio Hot Tub. <laughs> Radio Hot Tub. <laughs> So tell me your band, what you do, and why you do it. First, let's start with Joshua in the middle. It's Pining Hearts. Pining Hearts, and you play everything. Saxophone and sing and guitar. Sing. Play for what band, sir? Boxy Lemon. I'm pretty oh. sure you sing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, what's the other thing you do other than sing? It's convulsing, it's convulsing right? Convulsing, yes. Purging Satan. What a lot of people like this band, Boxy Lemon. As a matter of fact, when I bring up my favorite bands in Portland, 99% of the time, Foxy Lemon is one of the first names that comes up. Do you get enough love? No, way too much love, honestly. I got a big enough head about it. You, you know. may not know how much we all love you. I like your honestly, music. I like check your out music. Binding Hearts. Holy sexy with the saxophone over here, man. That's like a thing, but dude, I like it. Dude, you guys are awesome. Like, thank you, man. Unrehearsed is where it's at, isn't it? <laughs> Outside the Twilight Cafe, Foxy Lemon just rocked the night. What was going on in front of you? Now, you sit in the drums, so you get to see the asses of your friends. What is that experience like for you? It, there's a lot of really great asses on stage. I pretty, I can imagine that. asses. Oh, man, Casey's just, <laughs> mm. Is there a favorite? So Casey's the favorite. Casey's probably the favorite. But are you done? I don't think I'm done. Patrimony's next. I don't think I'm and done. And we're not done. Do you feel like you're 13? Yeah.
We have to know what's going on. Everybody's concerned. You're leaving for Nashville. What's going to happen in Nashville that couldn't happen in Portland? Magic. Magic? Do you still love Portland? I love Portland. I say every single day that we've spent in Portland, every single night, all the friends we've made, you guys, Fox Lemon, Cambrian Explosion, Police Me, Tango Alpha Tango, all of them are fantastic, and uh, they've helped us grow and influenced us so much, and uh, it'll never be forgotten, never. That's pretty much how it wraps up. So what is the point of this whole thing? I don't really know. Um, the dream, my goal, my, my ultimate vision would be to have this local station on a terrestrial airwave with a signal that could be heard in your car, in your home, anywhere. Um, have people be able to tune in, call in, chorus, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Combative with me, just call in and say who you like and who you don't. Maybe we'll say battles of the bands on the air, who gets kicked out, who gets added to the playlist. Grow, 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 and uh, get people interested in not just listening to the station, but going out and, um, is this still on? Is it, am I still there? Um, getting out, the idea is not only to make the station grow, but in, in turn also help get more people out to the clubs, more bands getting more following. It all just helps each other. I've watched it happen in the past with old radio stations. I still think it could work now. I know there's lots of other options. Bands don't have to hand out flyers on the street anymore, but I still think they should. Um, people don't have to actually go out to see a band. You could watch a video on YouTube but I think you should go out. Um, so hopefully that's the, the dream and the goal of Radio Hot Tub, is to bring these two things back together, which goes back to the title, Radio Killed the Radio Star. Hopefully Radio Hot Tub will revive it. And that's my little speech, and I went over an hour. How about that? Thank you. Oh, yeah, listen to Radio Hot Tub. Listen to Radio Hot Tub. That's it, yeah. I hope you don't have any questions, because I probably won't have an answer. There's a question. Yeah. What's the answer? Okay. <laughs> so, who are some of your favorite bands now? There's a lot. I'm a late bloomer to King Black Acid. You know who that is? I didn't know who they were, um, but they were one of the bands that got added to the playlist. Uh, when the first time I went to see them, I thought they were a new band. I had no idea. I was like, oh my God, this band is phenomenal. And then someone got next to me, she goes, no, they've been around since the late 1900s, or 19, late 1900s. <laughs> yeah, something like that, right? So, right now, they're my favorite. But there's a lot of other bands and a lot of different venue, a lot of different styles. Um, psychedelic, like Cambrian Explosion, I really like. Pining Hearts, who I played on there, they're very soulful. Um, there's a lot of bands. The Verder Pantons are pretty good. <laughs> I haven't done a radio hot tub night with them yet, though. What we will. But yeah, there's a lot. I've, I've got 200. I've got over 200 bands on the playlist. So it'd be hard to narrow it down to even a top 10. Um, I'd say there's at least 50 that I really like. Like when I see them playing a club, it's like I want to go see them. So, there you go. Yes? If you're a newbie to frequenting local places to go, would you recommend any particular place or a few? Venues? Say, hey, you haven't been out very much. This is a great place to go check out local. Well, I'd say most people in the scene would probably agree. Mississippi Studios and the Doug Fur Lounge are the coolest clubs. Not so big that you have to like buy a ticket in advance and go sit in a big hall and not see the band. Those are probably the best. But I personally, I like a lot of the dive bars where there's no cover charge. Decent little stage. Furkin Tavern's great. The Lombard Pub is another one I like to go to. Um, there's so many. There's so many little bars that I like going to. But um, as far as overall sound, quality, and the whole picture, probably the Doug Fern in the Mississippi would be my favorites. I'd say most of the bands would probably agree with that. Yes? Well, thank you. You're a lovely, lovely bunch. And now I'm going to tap dance. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming out. We return on Tuesday, September 12th with artist and animal advocate Melody Owen with her talk, Zoomorphic Interlease, a talk about animals and their capacity for consciousness, intelligence, and language. It sounds super fascinating. And for information, check out our website.